Um, thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But today, we are thrilled to welcome Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and Reese Jones. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is a historian, author, memoirist, and speaker who researches Western Hemisphere history and international human rights. She has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades, and she's known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. Whether in political debates or discussions about immigration around the kitchen table, many Americans, regardless of, of party affiliation, will say proudly that we are a nation of immigrants. In her bold new book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, historian Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz asserts this ideology is harmful and dishonest because it serves to mask and diminish the U.S.'s history of settler colonialism, genocide, white supremacy, slavery, and structural inequality, all of which we still grapple with today. This paradigm-shifting new book charges that we need to stop believing and perpetuating this simplistic and ahistorical idea and embrace the real and often horrific history of the United States. Um, Dunbar Ortiz will be joined in conversation by Reese Jones, author of White Borders, The History of Race and Immigration in the United States from Chinese Exclusion to the Border Wall. Um, and uh, this event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if, if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, consider supporting Roxanne and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her book from us. A link to buy Not a Nation of Immigrants, along with Reese's books, will be shared in the chat a couple times tonight. So. Roxanne and Reese, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks so much for, for having us. I'm really excited to be here and to have this conversation with Roxanne. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, coming to you from Honolulu, from the former Kingdom of Hawaii, um, unceded lands of the kingdom. Um, so, Roxanne, I'm so excited to talk to you about this book. Um, as you know, we have the same editor at Beacon Press, and um, she's been telling me about this book for, uh, for years um, as I've worked on my book, and she's talked about how the two books speak to each other, um, and she's wanted us to get together, and so here we are, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled to have this chance to talk to you. Um, wh what I thought you could do to start us off is um, to talk about this new book, um, Not a Nation of Immigrants, within the history of your other work, because you've been working on these issues of um, indigenous rights to land. Um, you have a really well-known book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, so I thought you could start the conversation by telling us about that past work and how it leads to this current book project. Well, uh, thank you, Reese, and thanks for joining me in conversation. And thanks to the wonderful Powell Bookstore and uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us. Yeah, I never really thought of um, writing this book. Um, our common editor suggested it at some point. I had in an indigenous people's history of the United States, I had just one paragraph, not a very large paragraph, uh, just kind of you know discrediting the myth, calling it a myth. Um, because I, I've written, you know, researched and written and observed so much um, settler colonialism, not only in the United States, but in you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Israel, Palestine. Um, I, um, I, you know, it just seems so inappropriate to mask settler colonialism. It's not that immigration didn't happen. It's that it isn't what started the United States. It didn't, it was almost a hundred years before the first, um, actually it was a hundred years before the first immigration law, which was exclusion, <laughs> exclusion of Chinese and then 
the next one was exclusion of all Asians. So I'm not sure that's even an immigration <laughs> um, document. It's an exclusion document. So um, uh, I kept, uh, I was kind of raging about it, you know, in some of my talks and what we used to write these blogs back when the internet, before Facebook and, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, um, monthly reviews started a blog. And so I, I, you know, I posted a few rants. I call them rants, <laughs> you know, ranting, I guess. And one was, stop calling this a nation of immigrants. So I kind of laid out in a very short form, you know, kind of raging. And it kind of went, uh, I'm not sure we're saying this, this word viral, but it spread, people spread it and reprinted it in different, you know, websites. And so it, it, it became a kind of, you know, it, but it didn't, it, it wasn't something that I, uh, I put the paragraph in the indigenous people's history, but our common editor, Guy Tripp, um, wonderful editor is, is an immigrant. She came as a, a, a child from India with her family. And she was very interested in this concept because she just, like most people accepted it, that this, well, you know, uh, this is what the United States is. So she suggested I write the book. And I think because of when she made the suggestion also coincided with the musical, Hamilton, the musical, which is a, an extravaganza of a nation of immigrants <laughs> calling Hamilton a settler colonial settler and immigrant. Um, so among other things. So I was, you know, I, I went to see it because I felt like I couldn't criticize it unless I, I observed it myself, it was miserable three hours. And um, paired up with Ishmael Reed, the playwright and novelist uh, a lot. Uh, he wrote a play about it and we had a little coterie of people, you know, um, criticizing it. And so that, I was gonna do a really small book. This is how we conceived it, a, a small book, maybe 150 pages or 200 pages, a hardback, but very small, focusing on, on the musical. But then I started doing research and I discovered, I, I have to say, after all of that ranting and everything, I never did research. Where did that term come from? I just assumed that, you know, it was some saying like, oh, it's a cloudy day, you know, <laughs> a depressing day, or I mean, just some saying that um, uh, that you don't really know the root of. And to find out it was so recent, you know, 1958, that it was John F. Kennedy who invented the term. It was no accident. He's son of immigrants and Catholic and uh, preparing to run for president. So it's a little propaganda piece. It's a very weird book. Um, it doesn't mention the border or Mexicans or any or Hispanic or anything like that. It's mostly about the Irish famine refugee and, um, and, and the valiant Irish and it even calls indigenous people, uh, Native Americans, uh, the first immigrants. So it's um, it's a popular book. It's still a bestseller. It's never been out of print. It's been in many, many editions with many introductions. And you can go to Amazon and find two or three web pages listed <laughs> as a different edition. They're all the his text is all the same. But the explanatory things are interesting too. So that that really struck me as um, as an important thing to look into. So it started going beyond um, just a critique of uh, of the musical and the explanation of settler colonialism not being you know that there were no immigrants as such until 
the Irish famine refugees, and they were refugees. And in fact, I calculated, I know that um, Han Viet um, Nguyen, um, who wrote the uh, Nothing Ever Dies, the nonfiction book, wrote the sympathizer and the commitments. Um, but this nonfiction book is, is a brilliant book. Um, he really does statistically show that most people called immigrants to the United States have actually been refugees, either economic or political refugees, or especially a good portion of them, at least half results of wars of the United States. Which brings one um, African writer, a memoir, uh, a, an immigrant to say, we are here because you were there. You know, so a, it's a manifesto. It's actually South Asian, uh, a manifesto, an immigrant's manifesto, the title of the book. So that, you know, reading all, I, I started reading it, it grew into a bigger book, it ended up being, <laughs> Uh, nearly 400 pages long instead of 150 pages long. Um, my editor, actually, I had forgotten the word count and I hadn't looked back at the contract to see it's 150, 200 pages. Um, so I, oh, I was devastated, you know, when I, I, I wrote uh, uh, our editor and said, well, you know, this is like, <laughs> really long, I got to do a lot of work. And she, she had been reading chapter by chapter, but had, you know, it's pandemic time. She hadn't really noticed that 45 page chapters and there were more and more of them coming in. And so um, she said, well, I like it, you know. Let's, so, she, you know, they had to change a lot of things. They had to change the pricing. They had to change the, you know, the period of time is complicated changing. Um, at that point uh, in like last November, a year ago, only a year ago. So, um, but I, I really appreciate it because I, I think everything in it, you know, is, is important. It takes off on, you know, my research took me to many places um, that I hadn't planned on in my original outline. So that's kind of, and so how it fits is, it, it's really interesting because so much of it was new to me and discovering this incredible archive of, of, of mostly Asian, African um, memoirs and books. Um, it was, it's really impressive, you know, what immigrants and, and children of immigrants have, have been writing, you know, just in the past 15, 20 years, all of these, and several have come out since my book was published or since it went to press and I couldn't include them, you know, so it's, I was very impressed with that. So I had access, you know, I had to do everything online I had done a lot of the research before, initially when I got the contract and you know writing the proposal. So I had I uh, I didn't really have to do anything that wasn't online, but I had to buy a bunch of books <laughs> to read. Um, yeah, I'm buying a new bookcase. So so that's that's really how uh, how it came about. Yeah. Um so in the book, you say that the, the idea of nation of immigrants, and this is a quote, erases the scourge of settler colonialism and the lives of indigenous peoples, unquote. Um, I think you know, scholars and activists use the term settler colonialism pretty commonly now. But I would guess that a, a number of people at, at the event today maybe are not as familiar with that term or could use a little deeper explanation of it. So I thought maybe a good place for you to start would be to tell us about settler colonialism and then think about how Nation of Immigrants obscures that. Yes, uh, and also enslaved Africans not being immigrants. John F. Kennedy actually includes Africans as Im immigrants. <laughs> Um, 
So settler colonialism is, is not a new terminology, but I think it's, it's come to be in use uh, in this country, you know, for identifying what happened in the United States and comparative and other places. It's a particular form of colonialism that started at the same time as administrative colonialism, Spanish style, Mexico and so forth, um, where they wanted the labor, you know, the labor of the people, not necessarily the land. I mean, they took the land too, but they wanted the labor people to work the land. Um, so it, um, England had already colonized uh, Wales and Scotland and Ireland. Um, not, uh, but only Ireland developed, a, um, did they develop a settler colonialism. So it was a first, um, there's actually a previous, you know, the, like the onset of the ethnic cleansing of the Moors and Jews from the Iberian Peninsula that then created Spain, you know, the, the crown, the, the, that um, the deportation, mass deportation of people who've been there for a thousand years and built, you know, everything beautiful that exists in Spain, <laughs> Moorish design. Um, and, they, and libraries, they built libraries, they translated books into Arabic from the Greek and Rome. Uh, all of this made, you know, a, a gift to Western civilization in the end, or a theft, you might say. But this process over a period of centuries produced the, you know, actually European colonialism uh, and the doctrine of discovery. So Britain had already been colonizing Ireland. So this is kind of a parallel development of settler colonialism because they did, you know, in Spain, they replaced, they took over, developed fields, developed cities and brought in Northern, Northern uh, Iberian people uh, into, you know, run the place. Of course they ran it into the ground. <laughs> By 1588, they were bankrupt, but continued their colonialism. But in um, Ulster, in Northern Ireland, under the Protestant Cromwell administration, they decided to uh, try to destroy Catholicism in colon colonized Ireland, that this was feeding resistance, you know, the, the Catholic the Catholic Church was the center of people's resistance or their inspiration. Um, so they started recruiting uh, Welsh and Anglo, but mainly Scots, Lowland Scots, to, to go in and as, as settlers, um, push the people, you know, push the Irish off their small land holdings. Um, into the periphery, so they had to then work as tenant farmers or day workers or starve. Um, of course, they developed the monocrop of uh, potatoes, which eventually led to the famine when the Irish potato failed. So this was the first deliberate um, settler colonialism, you know, that was thought out as a way of control and um, de to defeat any resistance. So these Scots-Irish became major um, settlers also in other colonies, uh, the North American colonies, and then of course later in Australia, and New Zealand and, and Canada. Uh, and they kind of become almost professional <laughs> settler colonialists. Ninety percent of the people in Appalachia are white and descended from. And my own Dunbar family is descended from 
um, these Scots Irish settlers. So I have an oral history knowledge of my dad's pride, you know, being Scots Irish. And um, so this is, you know, a, a um, it, it's different from the early colonialists that came to, they, they too were, you know, had the goal of taking the land and eradicating native people. Uh, but they more sparsely replaced them, you know, and, and basically the majority of the population in the richest colonies, these, uh, the slave economy, the plantations producing um, cotton in particular um, were, you know, uh, majority African, uh, enslaved Africans. So, but not, they were not settlers, of course, they were brought in chains and so, but this, this 13 colonies were taken over a period of 150 years of violence and pushed native people, didn't kill them all off, they pushed them into the periphery. They joined other confederations, the Tuscaroras went from North Carolina to the Haudenosh joined the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, became the Six Nations of the Iroquois. So there was, you know, it was a disruption and an ethnic cleansing, and that became the template for the founding of the United States was to continue doing that to uh, the Pacific, to take the continent that was enunciated in the, by the founders, their goals. And in the Northwest Ordinance, of course, it was laid out. Uh, so in that chapter, which is chapter two, Settler Colonialism, I go into great detail of how that worked in the Northwest Territory and the Platte system of uh, creating real estate as a commodity, these 160 acres, these rectangles. If you fly over the country, you look down, you see geometry <laughs> like no other place in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the I think you do a great job in the book of kind of illustrating how that process happens and the impacts of it um, and in your, your previous work as well. Um, so the term nation of immigrants, right? This, this is a phrase that is, I think, you know, baked into our collective memory at this point, right? It's something that is just part of who Americans think they are. Um, you know, the, the Biden campaign, their immigration policy is titled the Biden plan for securing our values as a nation of immigrants, right? Um, right. So it's it's this phrase that is just so common these days. Um, but in the book, you talk about how it's really in the, the late 1950s that the phrase comes into being. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about why it happens then um, and, and how it so quickly becomes such a common sense way of understanding the history of the country. Yeah, it, it is interesting, the timing of, of when it came right in the post-war period and, and uh, really in, you know, in, um, during the, the McCarthy era and the, you know, the, the suppression of any kind of leftism in the country. There was this, uh, and then uh, of course the civil rights movement was, was heating up I mean, in the 1950s after the, especially after the the school desegregation opinion um, in, uh, in uh, 1953. So soon after that, the John Burke Society, all these white nationalist groups also were. So you had this, this, this and, and then Vietnam, because Vietnam was, they were already interfering in Vietnam, you know, when the French, uh, when the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, that, that's when the US um, secretly took over, um, began, you know, beginning uh, their own uh, colonial war there to maintain, uh, uh, you know, in that, uh, to keep it from going um, communist. So, and they'd already had the Korean War. So this was a very volatile period. It was also the, um, the time of the uh, Bracero program was still going on. Uh, and it, it really was stunning to me that in Kennedy's old book, A Nation of Immigrants, that he seemed unaware of the Bracero program. 
are just blind. Uh, there's just no Mexicans and no border in this in this book. Um, I thought, how could he be? This was, uh, and also Operation Wetback, which was legislation that, you know, that started earlier, but it was still, you know, it was being renewed. It was on television all the time. Television was new and it was, it was really a show to make it look like they were deport. They did deport a lot of people, uh, over a million and planes and boats. And it was a big, a big, um, extravaganza and said, look what we're doing, you know, keeping these people out and everything. Um, and not to mention anything, it seemed like it had something to do with immigration. <laughs> so um, I think it was, uh, you know, that kind of stunned me, but on the other hand, I thought um, at that time, um, People probably were, and Kennedy probably was aware that this wasn't really what they meant by immigration because they didn't consider, they still were, you know, focused on uh, European immigration. They had opened it up to Eastern European, Southern European uh, in, you know, in the 18, uh, in the, during the Industrial Revolution, the 1880s. But those first laws were all exclusion, exclusion, exclusion. And then in 1924, they excluded even, you know, the, the, they put such quotas, no Latin Americans, no Caribbeans, no Eastern Europeans or Southern Europeans. They put, just put the cap on it. And only Western Europeans could really come. And they deported nearly 2 million Mexicans um, in, uh, during the depression, uh, of course, of course they they never did. There were so many undocumented. What it did, what it, the effect it has, the threat of deportation, the cruelty of of the border is to create undocumented workers who then have no rights, no path to citizenship, and can be abused and can be exploited. And when the border was open, uh, they could go back and forth. It was purely to support their families at home. But then as, you know, as the border uh, became tightened, increasingly, they couldn't go back. They're stuck here. So uh, at any one time, there are tens of millions of undocumented people. It's not certain that the majority are necessarily Mexican or Central America. There's a lot of Irish, <laughs> undocumented Irish right here in my neighborhood in San Francisco, but they're never deported, you know, or never questioned. Um, so I think um, the opening, I think one thing that Kennedy is child of immigrants, he had a consciousness about immigration and started working on a new immigration law that did, he was then assassinated and it took effect under Johnson in 1965 that opened up the quotas to um, the rest of the world, uh, increased them tremendously. So that's when we began having more South Asians, uh, Chinese could come legally finally. Up until that time, they were excluded. All Asians were excluded completely. So everyone who came was illegal, was undocumented and contingent and, you know, and uh, subject to deportation. When workers were needed, you know, they were tolerated and then when not, they're, they're deported. So it's such a, and I know in your book, uh, your underlying thesis, you know, is the inherent racism of the uh, of the um, uh, U.S. immigration policies and practices that is so, of course, in the whole society. The you know, structurally, the racism and racial capitalism is so inherent. But I think a lot of people don't 
think of immigration in that way. So I think your book really contributes enormously to a uh, deeper understanding, you know, of, of these what seem like normal normalized practices. That I mean, everyone got all upset when Trump started openly doing what every other president had done, and and. And the one right before him, Obama, you know, had, had deported more people than Trump got around to doing because he had eight years to do it. Uh, so, and now we see same thing. That's the one consistent thing with every administration. It doesn't change. So I actually wondered what you uh, think about that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think that's the place where our two books really kind of complement each other. Because um, in your book, you're talking about the kind of the the forgetting of this settler colonial history, and then kind of hiding it behind this notion that the U.S. is this country of immigrants. Um, what the story I tell in White Borders is to to pick that up with these immigration laws that you're talking about, right? So to um, to think about because you're right that I think most people seem to just assume that it's normal for a country to have immigration laws and it's something neutral that countries do. Um, and what I argue in the book is that the history of U.S. immigration laws is not neutral at all but rather there's been a very particular purpose behind all of the laws that we've seen. Um, and it's, it's been protecting an idea of a white country. Um, as you've talked about, the first national immigration laws are targeting Asians and Chinese immigrants. Um, the 1924 law has strict limits on um, most groups of people, even Southern and Eastern Europeans, right? Um, and you, you kind of suggested that the 1965 law allowed more diverse immigration, and it did. But if you look at the debates leading up to it, that was not their intention, right? The, yeah. um, the, the, the intention at the time was to keep the same demographics of the country, but to just get rid of the kind of overtly racist national origins quotas right. from 1924. Um, it's, it's almost by accident that it produced more diverse immigration. Um, but in the debates leading up, they were trying to take steps to avoid that. Right. So, um, for example, the 1965 law has a lot of visas for family reunification. Um, and if you look at the, the discussions at the time, the idea was that that would produce a lot of white immigrants to the country because the U.S. was 90 percent white at that time. And so the idea was in their thinking that the people applying for family reunification visas citizens asking for their brothers or their mothers or their, their siblings to come um, would mostly be white. And so that it would produce a 90% flow of white people continuing to arrive in the country. Um, it didn't work out that way, but that was not the intention at the time, right? So even that law that's produced more diverse immigration was certainly based in a, in a white supremacist version of who belongs in the US. Um, so um, yeah, I think that, that there, there are a lot of overlaps and kind of the end of my book, what I talk about is um, to think about why the Trump era happened when it did. And I, I look at the figures behind the scenes. I talk a lot about the Tanton network of anti-immigrant groups um, that brought this anti-immigrant um, perspective back into the mainstream and the public discourse in the US. Um, so maybe you can before I ask you another question, I just want to remind the audience that in a few minutes, we're going to take some Q&A from the audience. So be sure to use the Q&A um, uh, function to, to put your questions there. And we'll I'll pose some of those to Roxanne in just a minute. Um, before I do that, though, Roxanne, in a couple of different chapters in the book, and I'm going to give you an option of who you want to talk about here, um, you have a chapter that is about Alexander Hamilton and kind of talking about the, the reframing of his history as an immigrant history. Um, you have another chapter about Columbus and kind of the, the effort to make Columbus an American hero and kind of a symbol of Italian American identity. Um, maybe you, you could talk about both of those or maybe there's one or the other of those stories that you wanna tell us now. Well, yeah, the, the Columbus chapter really evolved because it's the chapter really on um, Eastern European and Southern uh, European immigration. Um, and it's of course when the Statue of Liberty was uh, established and the, you know, everyone's welcome, uh, this, this, this kind of thing, because they really needed a workforce, you know, for 
the industrial machinery for the mining, building the railroads, excluding Chinese and you know all the Chinese who come are undocumented, unwanted. Um, so they want Europeans that they they can get them. So they here you have for the first time uh, people being welcomed who do not speak English and who are actually very dark, you know, the Sicilians and Southern uh, Italians, mainly not the Northern Italians, were the main ones um, coming to work. They were tenant farmers, they were very, very poor. Many of them wanted to come and make money and go back, buy a piece of land, you know, and be real far, you know, have their own farmland or sending money back. I mean, they were not, you know, the American dream <laughs> mythology uh, coming for the American dream, they were treated very badly. Uh, so one way that, uh, and then there was, the, you know, they were Catholic too, and the Eastern Europeans were Catholic and Jewish. Uh, so here was new languages, different people, different languages. And so, uh, the, how Columbus got um, instrumentalized, it always been this, you know, they, to my surprise, I did not know this before, but I ran on to it in a book, I, wow, I didn't know that, that the founders, and they're quoted, you know, that um, actually uh, debated naming the United States Columbia. And, um, the first mention of Columbus is in 1724, where he's mentioned as the founder of the United of um, uh, of the colonies. You know the the the, the original founder. So he's posed very early on in the United States, the new United States, as the first founder, um, as the first. And then later, this is framed as the first immigrant. And this is then presented, uh, especially to the Italians, uh, that as, as their forebearer, that they are, they are descendants, not only of Catholicism, you know, the Catholic uh, Columbus, which, you know, is a very, there were, extreme prejudice is a very Protestant country and extreme prejudice against Catholics. It really went up into the mid, you know, until we got the full Supreme Court of Catholic. Uh, it's really changed. But the Catholic Church in the process was also Americanized, patrioticized. You know, it, it's a very interesting process that starts with instrumentalizing Columbus as the first founder as the original founder of the United States. Um, so that surprised me how far back the Columbus myth went and reverence. There are statues of him all over the place, you know, even, um, uh, even in the 18th century. So it, it's, I thought it was something fairly new, you know, the, 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 the sons of the, um, uh, that was invented, you know, kind of as a, to give to the Italians. But, but it did, you know, it, it, Italians took that uh, as, as an identity, as being indigenous. You know, I talk about self-indigenizing of settlers and how immigrants become settlers in that way through, in, in the case of the Italians and other Catholics, Irish Catholics and Polish Catholics and Czech Catholics. German Catholic, they, you know, it's a double, a, a double inheritance that in that way, they come to be, see themselves as original people, not immigrants, but settlers. And I think how the Irish do it, you know, in my long chapter on, on uh, Irish, um, is, is really becoming the police. You know, that they just happened, the Irish refugees came at just the time when they're building, they're developing modern police forces, what became modern police forces in the big cities in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. And 
at first, the Irish had a lot of gangs, you know, and the movie Gangs of New York really, uh, I think, did a good job of, of portraying that. Um, but they, they were fighting these new police, you know, and um, uh, then they would get recruited and then they would recruit other people from their county and, you know, people Irish to, identified with the counties in Ireland and their clan. And so they grew and grew until they became um, the majority of police in cities that spread across the country. And of course, police unions today are mainly dominated still by Irish. Uh, so this is, that was the Americanization process of the Irish is to become the police. They, many of them were also worked in slave patrols um, in, in the South, you know, where policing also emerged, that kind of control policing of black and other dark people. So blue-eyed blonde, uh, English speaking helped a lot the Irish who were very colonized and oppressed become settlers from a settler colony of Britain to become settlers in the United States. It's a tragic story, you know, I, I almost cried sometimes <laughs> writing it, you know, because there's a lot of romanticizing around the Irish and the beautiful language and poetry and the colonial situation and republicanism. And uh, it sort of pokes a hole in that, <laughs> you know, in, in, in that mythology. Yeah, I think that leads into the last question I was going to ask you before we do some of the, the Q&A. Because um, in the conclusion, you talk about how the project of settler colonialism is ongoing. Um, you, you write, quote, one of the unspoken requirements for immigrants and their descendants to become fully American has been to participate in anti-Black racism and to aspire to whiteness. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that you know, that um, whiteness is not necessarily like blood quantum whiteness, but white uh, behavior, you know, settlerism, what created the country in the first place, because up until the Irish famine refugees came, everyone before that came as a settler. You know, they didn't flee anything, um, you know, pilgrims, yeah, fled religious persecution supposedly, but they actually formed a corporation that was a business corporation to make money <laughs> and build their church uh, in a new place. So from, you know, from the very beginning, um, it was a settler colony, uh, you know, the, the, these colonies were settler colonies and inherent in settlerism, settler colonialism, is genocide because the erasure of people, either making it, uh, you know, under the genocide convention, this not just killing people, but also creating conditions that make it impossible for a people to stay together as a people and be viable. Uh, it's the only international law that deals with groups. So it's a very important to understand. It doesn't mean killing all the people off. They're Jews. There's a Jewish state, you know, uh, it, it, so the Holocaust was not, you know, Holocaust denials as well. Jews didn't all die off, but that's a misinterpretation of what, you know, what genocide is. Um, genocide is disabling the effective existence, and that still goes on today. Um, native land base is in trust, it's not owned. It could be taken away with a stroke of a pen in Congress tomorrow, no more existence, that, that's genocide. So um, that's the, that's still the uh, case, you know, that, that uh, um, the land bases, uh, I mean, most native, native nations don't even have viable land bases and they have an administrative uh, unit that, uh, because their land was allotted um, and sold off, it's checkerboarded. Um, 
some, you know, some areas are, are um, majority native population, like parts of Dine, um, Navajo Nation. But it, it keeps getting broken down and they're not viable nations. So the land that was taken without treaties, which is mostly the land of um, under the Bureau of Land Management under the Department of Interior is uh, all, almost all federal land is what was taken without treaty and needs to be restored to each of the applicable people whose land it was taken from, you know, like the Northern Paiute in Oregon and where we are now in Portland uh, in, in Eastern Oregon and Washington State. Uh, so this is this is the project, you know, that I think to defeat that earth colonialism and the concept of it has to start with that with this land justice and land uh, land restitution for Native people. And for especially for you know I say in the book too that I, I really write this for immigrants, new immigrants especially, the children of immigrants to understand that they can choose not to be settlers. They can choose to be advocates, you know, for, um, for you know, for the restitution of, of native land. And I think in Canada, there's a lot more consciousness of that. There's a lot more work done between immigrants, thanks to Harsha Walia mainly, um, in building no one is illegal and the South Asian immigrant family um, having, you know, building these links with Native people and having a solidarity struggle. So that's, um, that's hopeful. We have nothing like that in the United States right now. There's almost no relationship from immigrant organizations and Native organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Harsha Walia's work is is really amazing. We had her here to the University of Hawaii a few years ago, and it was a, a really great talk. And she's doing um, great things. She had a book that just came out earlier this year, in fact. Um, okay, let's turn to the questions. Um, what, maybe we could start with a short question, um, because there have been a couple of the questions that have asked if you could um, specify how you define an immigrant in the book. Um, so if you could just kind of quickly discuss that, and then we can move to a couple of the more substantive ones. Yeah, well, you know, as a historian, I do it chronologically that up until the um, Irish famine refugees showed up in the millions uh, in the late 1840s, everyone who came before then came as a settler. Um, and the most recent large number were the Scots-Irish in the early 1700s who um, settled Appalachia and make up 90% of Appalachia. They're the same, same people who colonized Northern Ireland. So they're seasoned settlers, almost professional settlers. Uh, so none of those people are immigrants and the portrayal of Alexander Hamilton as an immigrant from the Caribbean to a colony, another British colony to go to Columbia University. This would be like today a student, uh, someone in California, who decides to go to Columbia University. You wouldn't call that person an immigrant to New York. So you wouldn't call Alexander Hamilton an immigrant moving from one colony to the other, because he's a British citizen with all the rights of the British citizens wherever he went in the British Empire. So that that that's the, the underlying deception of a nation of immigrants is dating it back to the beginning, and in that way, erasing settler colonialism, and by default, erasing Native people, you know, kind of a literature genocide. <laughs> it's like, oh, they don't exist, you know, or you call them the first immigrants like John F. Kennedy did. So, okay, another question. Um, this is from Anand. Um, he or she asks, so much of what passes off as America's history is really mythology, um, nation of immigrants being one example of that, so much so that it has now become the accepted conventional wisdom and anything even hinting to the contrary is deemed as unpatriotic. 
how does one change that narrative at scale um, to give a truthful retelling of the past um, and do it without stigma? That's a really good question. I've racked my brain for many years <laughs> trying to figure out how, how we can change this. I have a, a little litany at the end of the book about how, how people who are, are radical or doing something radical apologize for being um, that and saying they love America and they're patriotic. I've told him Paratonak when he kneeled, you know, he explained it later. He says, I, I'm not unpatriotic. I love this country. It's my country, you know, and it, it almost nullifies the act, you know, because in fact, there's something wrong, you know, or he wouldn't be doing that, risking his career, losing his career made great sacrifice. So I think there's so, um, it's always been there, this, you know, this insistence that you, you chant, this is the greatest country in the world. This is the shining city on the hill. This is, there's never been another country like it. You have to do that if you're gonna run for office or school board or, <laughs> church deacon or anything else. You know, you're you're basically, I mean, you can hide away in universities like some of us do. Um, and even there, sometimes you get in trouble like after 9-11, if you said, well, maybe something we did before brought this about, well, fire that person, you know, completely fire. I think 10 different people were fired from their jobs, some of them tenured, um, just, just for making a comment like that. And others were attacked, like Susan Sontag, uh, who was no, you know, was no raving radical by any means. <laughs> and so it's, it's, that teaches people. And of course, especially contingent people, people waiting for citizenship or, you know, or to be naturalized. Um, or applying, um, this is, you know, uh, scary. Uh, and so this intimidation, and then it was really ramped up during the McCarthy period, you know, questioning people's, you know, are you a communist? Have you ever been a communist? And as if, you know, you couldn't be patriotic and say be a communist, <laughs> like most, I don't know, communist countries. Have seemed to have a lot, quite a, quite a bit of patriotism involved in it too. So it's um, it is, and it, even James Baldwin. I mean, as radical as James Baldwin was, and as, as clear, he too said, "I he said more than once, you know, I I want to make it clear, I love America. It's the greatest country in the world, and that's why I think I have the right to say this." But why does he have to say that? Why do we have to say these preambles to any kind of criticism? You know, it's uh, it's abnormal. I mean, it's some people call it Stalinist, but I'm not even sure that. I mean, Stalin wanted to be worshipped, but I'm not sure you have to say I adore the Soviet Union more than anything in the world. You know, it's it's almost unimaginable any other place, you know, even where there is kind of extreme um, nationalism, that there has to be this litany of them. Um, so it's puzzling how to get rid of it is, where do we even start? And I think it's just telling the truth about US history and getting banned, our books banned and <laughs> laws against critical race theory. <laughs> yep. Um, so we probably have time for one last question. Um, and so there's one that's asking us to think a little bit towards the future. So it says, how do you see the current U US immigration debate evolve given its racist history, which many people are not willing to acknowledge, right? So um, so what do you see happening? Maybe, maybe I'll split this question into two things. Um, you know, what do you see happening in the next few years? And what would you, what would is your hope? Like, what would be the ideal thing that would happen, right? So um, if you could tell us about both of those things, I think that would be great. Yeah, and maybe Reese, you could add, you could add your thoughts on this too. I'm sure you've thought about it. 
Um, I would like to see um, an open border at Mexico, the open Mexico US border that, you know, stealing ha through war, vicious counterinsurgency war to take the Northern half of Mexico. It is really an illegal border. It was a treaty, uh, a forced treaty, the gun at the head, you know, uh, occupied Mexico City, the Texas Rangers raping and, and killing people, um, terrorism, until they submitted and signed over the Northern half. That's not legitimate. It's not a legitimate border. And so that, that's what I wish and that's what I hope we listen to people, the no borders people, and no one is illegal, um, and, and really develop a mass movement around it. At times we've had larger, you know, stronger movements uh, back in the 1960s, the Chicano movement made great strides in creating a more open border. And it's just, especially since 9-11, you know, they've used that terrorism. Not, I don't think a single so-called terrorist has ever been detected on US borders. Um, but nevertheless, it, you know, it really ramped up after that, but it wasn't new. I mean, this is this expulsion and then allowing people to come in, in a contingent way um, and developing a fascistic police force. Um, I'm not sure if that's not a redundant term, fascist police, but uh, on the border, it's far worse than any other police force. They were taking some of them to Portland, you know, when the demonstrations were going on and it was pretty vicious. People got a, a taste in Portland of what goes on every day on the border. So I think we have to uh, stop teaching it, treating it as a natural phenomenon. The, you know, the bloody border and the uh, sealing the border and building a fence. Um, it just has, you know, that has to change. Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, and, and the legitimacy, if Mexico had any power, they could go to the world court in a day and get that treaty nullified and renegotiate it, but they can't do that because the U.S. would crush them more than they do now. <laughs> you know? um, so they don't. No one has the power to challenge it. Only us. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in in white borders, I the, I, I make the case for the fact that immigration restrictions are a tool of white supremacy. And it's something that protects it, protects the privilege of the elites of these settler states. And so if you are against those things, you should be against border restrictions, um, because that's the purpose that they've served over over 100 years. And so really, we should be working towards a world where there is freedom of movement. Um, and the state isn't the arbiter of who has the right to move. Um, so um, I think we're, we're on the same page there. So um, so we've we've used up our hour. This has gone really quickly. Um, it's been really great talking to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have a, a last um, thing that you want to say, but um, I'll I can also turn it back over um, to uh, to Nick um, if if you're ready, Nick. If you yeah, if you have something you'd like to say, Roxanne, feel free. If you'd like to have any closing words. No, well, just thank you so much. Thank pals as always. And thank you, Reese. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation. Thank everyone for being with us. Yes. And uh, yeah, thank you both just so much for, uh, for coming, joining us today and for the conversation and all that. It was uh, tremendous and just great to have you. Um, and I, uh, so I want to encourage everyone to uh, go and get this book here. It's a, uh, and I put a link for pals.com, but also just can search the title on pals.com for this. Also Reese's book here is also available. So both of these new books um, and certainly uh, yet. Yeah. And while, um, while you're on pals.com, please go check out our upcoming events and all that. And uh, we hope to see you out there. So 
thank you all of us for joining us tonight. And thank you, you both so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Good night. Bye. All right. Bye.